Hey, mushroom friends, it's Anna McHugh. I'm out on a beautiful Saturday morning, uh, picking mushrooms, seeing what I find. And I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about the variability that you will see in different kinds of mushrooms. This is one of our uh, sort of summer edible species, Areoboletus betula. Um, it is very distinct and recognizable because it has this shaggy stem. Its uh, common name is the shaggy stemmed bolete, and it's a spongy uh, layer underneath. Uh, so it's sort of like, um, here, let me show you. So we're going to do uh, an exercise in hand lensing here. So basically what you can see here is it's got like a tube layer underneath. So shaggy stalk boletes, you have uh, sort of the shaggy stem tube underneath. But as you can see, you have a lot of variability both in size. So this is an immature specimen and a fairly mature one but also uh, in color. So you can see you have, uh, you know, everything from this reddish color. It actually, this mushroom gets uh, far more of a like dark cherry red sometimes. I just couldn't find one. Uh, all the way to this yellowish color. So boletes in general, these are the, you know, spongy underbottomed uh, mushrooms oftentimes change colors pretty radically throughout their life cycle. Uh, but fortunately, Areoboletus betula with its uh, shaggy stem is really, really distinctive. So if you're interested in an edible mushroom and you're trying to, you know, acquire uh, a few more on your list uh, and don't have that one, that's a, a really good, very common and abundant edible mushroom. But as you can see, it, it varies a great deal. Um, and that really is the point I'm trying to emphasize here is that mushrooms will oftentimes surprise you. So I have two specimens I wanna show you. Uh, first, this is the smallest example I have ever found of Amanita jacksonii. So Amanita jacksonii is an edible mushroom that is uh, relatively common in our summer months in the southeastern US. We also have a lot of like relative species. They're all in Amanita section Caesariae, so the Caesar mushrooms. I have a couple of videos about that if you want to dig into that information a little bit more. But usually Amanita jacksonii is a much, much larger mushroom. So we're talking about at a minimum, you know, like three to five inches tall. Oftentimes, you know, I saw one up in the mountains a few weeks ago that was, you know, probably eight to nine inches tall. This little sucker, as you can see, let's see if I can get a good measurement on it. So this is centimeters here. So it looks like we have uh, just about six centimeters, which is really, really small. Uh, however, it has all of the features for Amanita jacksonii in the strict sense. So um, unless, you know, this is sort of um, an unknown form or an unknown species, this is Amanita jacksonii is just very, very small compared to what you would see in a field guide or observations that you would see on the internet. But let me go over the ID features really quickly. I do want to, um, you know, note that a lot of times when I have a mushroom that I'm, even one that I'm really familiar with, but it is so, so unusual, a specimen that I see, I will verify the ID before, uh, you know, eating it. I am hyper cautious about eating wild mushrooms, but nonetheless, you know, this is uh, a mushroom that, you know, I'm like, I'm going to show it to people and I can't imagine what else it would be, uh, except for the fact that it is just so very, very small. So anyway, let's go over our ID features really quickly. First of all, you have a really nice cap and stem mushroom. It is in the Amanita genus. So it is a gilled mushroom and has these little, uh, you know, gills underneath that are kind of a light yellow in color. Uh, other Amanitas have white gills, um, not exclusively, but most Amanitas have white gills. So Amanita section caesariae has a number of Amanitas a species with, uh, you know, more yellowy gill gills. We also have a mushroom, actually what I thought this was, is Amanita flavoconia. So it's a similar mushroom that is, uh, you know, yellowy with a little bit of red sometimes, and it has yellowy gills. So like not all Amanitas have white gills, but you know, for Amanita um, jacksonii, Amanita section caesarea, you oftentimes see a pale yellow, uh, you know, gill undersurface. The thing also uh, that is noteworthy here is you have a mushroom that's sort of, um, you know, an orangey red color. You have a little bit of a red sunburst here in the middle, really attractive. It's a little hard to see because it's so small, but you also have striations. So these are little stripy grooves that are along the margin of the cap that run uh, vertically so that you have little, you know, striations, little stripes. Uh, the thing though that really makes this look like Amanita jacksonii and not a different species. So all of the things that I just covered are uh, distinctive for Amanita section caesariae. Uh, the other feature that that particular group of mushrooms all share is this really nice cup of tissue at the base that is white in color. It's kind of rough and tough, like when you pick, pick the mushroom, 
it comes right up uh, along with it. Oftentimes the, you know, cups or it's stuff that's at the base of Amanita mushrooms and other mushrooms is a little bit fragile. So, you know, Amanita section Caesarea, when you pick it, oftentimes it comes up with this nice little cup of tissue that is, uh, you know, again, distinct from uh, the mushroom itself. And the, you know, yellow stalk goes all the way to the base here. Um, so, but the feature also uh, that really makes this look like Amanita jacksonii is it has these uh, sort of orange shags or scales. I've handled it a little bit, but they were more uh, sort of like pointy. Oftentimes in books, they're described as chevrons. Uh, but you know, it essentially oftentimes looks a little bit like stretch marks. So I have this material here. And then additionally, we have this really nice ring on the stem and it kind of is, you know, straight down and then it poofs out. It's very, uh, you know, looks very much like a flamenco skirt to me. Uh, and oftentimes it has a really sort of um, like slightly more orangey, uh, like the color of these uh, shags or scales. So you have, you know, a, a yellowish mushroom with orangey scales and a orangey, really nice uh, ring on the stem, red and orangey yellow striation with a cup of tissue at the base. And again, when you find this mushroom, it's typically going to be significantly larger than this. So this is a really good example of what mushrooms will always do, which is as soon as you think you understand them and you know what their habits are and that you've got your head around what, even what a species is, you'll find something or someone else will bring up a piece of information that makes you rearrange your, uh, you know, your internal schematic uh, of how you understand mushrooms. So Amanita jacksonii, but a very, very very dainty one at that. All right, the next one I want to talk about is a deadly mushroom. So this is uh, a destroying agile species of some kind. Um, I'm going to, without, you know, spending a lot of time on identification, I'm pretty confident this is Amanita bisporagera. So we have numerous uh, mushrooms that are called destroying angels. They are white Amanita mushrooms. They have a cup of tissue at the base of the stem. Uh, you know, you have a lot of white ish Amanitas that it's not as much of a cup so much as like sometimes it's more like a sock sometimes it's just a little bit of tissue at the base but in the case of Amanita uh well this is Amanita section phylloidea so that is inclusive of destroying angels which are all white in color you also have Amanita phylloides which is the death cap mushroom that is not white it's more of a uh, sort of like it's not colored yellow green situation it's it's a very attractive mushroom actually despite the uh, the choice that I used in drawing a comparison. But the thing that's interesting to me about this mushroom is, uh, you know, Amanita bisporagera, when I find it locally, is oftentimes a much, much smaller mushroom. So typically what you have, um, you know, I would find a mushroom that is open and fully mature. It's probably about the size of like from the base to the bottom of this cap here. Now, obviously you can tell this is a not a mature speci specimen. It hasn't even opened up yet. So like what you're going to see, this is a material that's called a partial veil. So essentially it just protects the mushroom's gills as the mushroom matures. And as it matures, that veil will break. And that's what leaves uh, a ring on the stem. So you can see this mushroom hasn't reached maturity yet. And you have, uh, you know, a really distinctive sort of layer here of, uh, of tissue that, that's going to break and leave that ring. So, you know, ultimately I'm not sure how tall this mushroom would get, but it's certainly would be uh, fairly tall and robust in size. So, you know, oftentimes you'll find mushrooms that really are outside of the norm for your area, but also mushrooms in different sort of like neighbor habitats that are quite different. So I was talking about that uh, uh, Amanita jacksonii that I saw up in the mountains a few weeks ago, and it was far larger than any of the ones that I find down here in the North Carolina Piedmont. Uh, and I don't know what the, you know, what that function is. Um, sometimes I suspect, and this is not, you know, based on anything, but I suspect that mushrooms oftentimes that grow in cooler temperatures, so at higher elevations or even just in cooler weather, have more time to get big and mature before they get eaten by bugs. Uh, and also just given how, you know, hot and stinky and humid it is, uh, you know, I think our mushrooms blow up and they're done really fast. Again, that is not based on any sort of empirical research is just interesting to me that oftentimes when I go to cooler climates, I'll see the same species, but sometimes they're like bigger and fatter and they're tastier in some cases or more colorful. 
Um, but you know, that is an area that I really want to look into more because as I've become more, you know, familiar with mushrooms over the last, uh, well, last lot of years, but especially in the focus time that I've had on it in the last few years, I have realized that, you know, I get an image or a gestalt of, um, for instance, Amanita bisporigera, the most common destroying angel mushroom. And it is a common mushroom. I see it almost every single time I go out foraging during the season. And it's typically a far, far smaller, certainly less fat, uh, you know, mushroom that's much more difficult also to collect intact. Like this, I can throw it around, I'm handling it, and it's not falling apart in my hands. But when you have smaller, frailer specimens, obviously, they are, they're not as easy to uh, be abusive toward. So I'm going to toss this. Despite the fact that this is deadly poisonous, you, um, well, I mean, it, it, more than likely, if I ate this mushroom, what would happen is uh, I would get very, very sick. And then I would expel all of the mushroom and I would start to feel better uh, probably about, you know, 16, 12 to 16 hours into this experience. And once I start to feel better, then I could suffer uh, liver failure. And then additionally, kidney failure is another risk with, uh, you know, destroying angels and, and uh, death caps and other mushrooms and Amanita section phylloidea. Uh, the likelihood is that I would get treatment and the fatality rate in, uh, you know, the United States is less than, I think it's around 10% or so. So the chances are that if I ate this mushroom, I would go to the hospital, have a terrible couple of days, maybe would end up with significant or permanent liver damage, but more than likely it wouldn't kill me. Uh, that said, you know, there's obviously no reason to trifle with Amanita mushrooms that are, well, any mushroom that you feel unclear of or uncertain of. However, all of that being said, despite the fact that this is deadly poisonous, it's like, well, you know, there are a lot of things in nature that are deadly poisonous. The number of plants that can, you know, knock you dead or do a lot of damage to you is oftentimes misunderstood, understated, and sort of like people don't worry about plants as much as I feel like they should worry about plants. Uh, when we're talking, um, you know, in the, in the scale of foraging, uh, because really there are a good number of mushrooms that will make you feel awful and they will make you poop and they will make you puke, but there aren't that many mushrooms that will actually kill you or do, you know, lasting, uh, permanent damage, uh, to your vital systems. And so ultimately I'm like, okay, we have, you know, hundreds of different species for me to study. I have many, many species I am comfortable eating that I really enjoy eating. And so, so when it comes to like finding new species to you know to check out and try I usually have so many options I don't even wander in the direction of things that could be dangerous and uh, you know I've been doing this for a long time and I also eat a good number of mushrooms so if it works for me maybe it'll work for you uh, and in conclusion again mushrooms just always surprise me that's part of the delight of them it's like I think I understand them and then they just give me the bird as it were and uh, then I wander off feel a little bit sorry for myself and then learn more and uh, become a wiser person for it. Anyway, I hope you're well. Let's talk again soon.